Welcome, Mr. Leno. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair, committee members. Thank you for your time today. As I introduce uh, SB 54 to you, let me say that there are probably few who were more disappointed with the passage of Proposition 8 and with the subsequent Supreme Court decision to validate it as constitutional. But the basis on which SB 54 is founded is directly taken from the Supreme Court decision ruling that Prop 8 is constitutional in the court case known as Strauss v. Horton. So what the bill does very simply is addresses the uncertainty of the status of those who married out of state. Strauss versus Horton uh, did not specifically address the marriages of same-sex couples who married out of state because no one in that situation uh, was a party in the case, so they could not rule on that. And it leaves many thousands of couples in a very uncertain situation right now. So I'm going to give you an example of a couple. We've got an actual couple who will share with you their tale. But I just want you to really put yourself in the situation of a particular couple, uh, let's say from the state of Iowa, who maybe grew up together, fell in love in high school, subsequently formed a family, raised a number of children, and then once the Supreme Court in Iowa determined that they could get married uh, as a same-sex couple, they did so. And so they now have the opportunity because of their corporation opening office, let's say in Silicon Valley, uh, opportunity of a lifetime because they maybe see their salaries uh, doubled as a result of this opportunity that they could take in California, provide a college education for their kids if they didn't think they could do so in Iowa. They take the job in California and they move their, themselves and their family to Silicon Valley. But now when they arrive here, are they married? They were married legally in Iowa. Are they married here in California? Strauss v. Horton was silent on their situation. So taking the substance and the very words of the decision, determining that Prop 8 is constitutional, we believe that it is appropriate for the legislature to clarify this ambiguity and determine that they are in fact married here in California. And I want to and I don't intend to uh, bore any of you, but I do want to share with you the very words of Strauss v. Horton uh, to show you on what basis uh, we believe SB 54 is very sound. Uh, I'm reading from the court decision, the majority opinion. In analyzing the constitutional challenges presently before us, we first explain that the provision added to the California Constitution by Proposition 8 when considered in light of the majority opinion in the marriage cases, that of course was the Supreme Court decision ruling unconstitutional, the denial of marriage licenses to same-sex couples, that's the marriage cases. Uh, when considered in light of the majority opinion in the marriage cases, uh, properly must be understood as having a considerably narrow scope and more limited effect than suggested by petitioners in the cases before us. Contrary to petitioner's assertion, Proposition 8 does not entirely repeal or abrogate the aspect of a same-sex couple's state constitutional right of privacy and due process that was analyzed in the majority opinion in the marriage cases. That is, the constitutional right of same-sex couples, same couples to choose one's life partner and enter with that person into a committed officially recognized and protected family relationship that enjoys all of the constitutionally based incidents of marriage. Instead, the marriage carves out the, me the measure, Prop 8, this is the Supreme Court's ruling that substantiated that it was constitutional, is on this basis. Instead, the measure carves out a narrow and limited exception to these state constitutional rights, reserving the official designation of the term marriage for the union of opposite sex couples at a, as, as a matter of state constitutional law, but leaving undisturbed all of the other extremely significant substantive aspects 
of same-sex couples' state constitutional right to establish an officially recognized and protected family relationship and the guarantee of equal protection of the laws. So wh what they were saying is that, yes, Prop 8 is constitutional, but only with this narrow exception of same-sex couples not being able to be determined married. Now that is for those who are going to be married after November 4th. We are all well aware that those who married before November 4th, after the marriage decision of uh, May of 2008, those 18,000 couples, we all know, the court ruled are married. So for those who were married out of state prior to November 4th, they come to California based on the court's ruling this bill will clarify that those couples are also legally married in California. How could they be otherwise? And just to read one other... If you could briefly, Mr. Leno. I'm sorry? Briefly, please, Mr. Leno. Very briefly, very briefly. I'll get to the good parts here. So, in sum, although Prop 8 changes the state constitution as interpreted in the majority opinion in the marriage cases to provide that restricting the family designation of marriage to opposite-sex couples only and withholding that designation from same-sex same couples no longer violates the state constitution. In all other respects, same-sex couples retain the same substantive protections embodied in the state constitution, rights of privacy and due process as those accorded to opposite-sex couples and the same broad protections under the state equal protection clause that are set forth in the majority opinion in the marriage cases. And then for those out-of-state couples, who may marry after November 4th, given, of course, that the exception of equal protection in this ruling is only for the designation of marriage, when those same-sex couples come to California, they will be afforded all the same rights, benefits, privileges, and the obligations and responsibilities of marriage. They will only not be recognized as married, and that is based solely on the reading of the decision. And then I just wanted to uh, bring up very briefly a couple of the oppositional arguments you're going to hear. I've seen in a report today in the news uh, that the Catholic, uh, California Catholic Conference is concerned on a couple of uh, issues. Uh, this is a gut and amend. Let me say that. This is a gut and amend. Uh, why are we doing this now as opposed to early in the year? Well, of course, the decision didn't come out until May 16th. That's just a couple, six weeks ago. So it took us a little while to do some study of this and to put it in a bill form. No, I guarantee you no process will be shortcutted uh, when this should this pass out of the assembly and make its way back for concurrence in the Senate, uh, quite happy to hear this, have this heard in the Judiciary Committee in the Senate. So no shortcut will be taken. Uh, they go on to say that, uh, that this is unnecessary because these same-sex couples could become domestic partners in California and have all the same rights, benefits of, of marriage uh, without the designation of it. But what they don't seem to understand, and you'll hear from couples themselves, is when those couples come to California and ma are married, uh, if it was before November 4th, they could not get married in California because you can't marry a second time when you're already married once. So they would not have that opportunity to get married. And so we just want to clarify that as well. So thank you for your hearing us today. Uh, we have a couple of uh, our sponsors who wish to speak, and then we have a couple who fit this exact situation to explain their predicament now because of the messy affair that inequality is. Thank, Thank you very much, Senator Leno. Again, a reminder, two witnesses on each side, to portion your witnesses as you'd like. Move very the good. bill. Thank you. So our sponsor, Equality California. Okay. It's been moved and seconded.